Can hear me, uh, Evangelist Josephine. I request yes. that uh, you offer the opening prayer. Please connect us with God. Amen. Thanks. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Please Sabbath. Please welcome and feel at the feet of Jesus as we pray. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come before your throne of grace once again this evening in humility, thanking you for your faithfulness unto us, that despite our sinfulness, your grace has abounded more. We thank you for the whole week and for taking good care of us. We thank you for your grace that has been sufficient for us. We thank you for inviting us into this wonderful rest with you in this Holy Sabbath. How we pray that as we are going to start the program tonight, we invite your presence, that your Holy Spirit may come down and take the lead. Make yourself manifest and use your servant in a marvelous way for the glory of your name. May he just be a vessel in your hands as you glorify yourself through this noble cause that he is going to do tonight. As, as he does it, we pray that you may also prepare our hearts to be receptive for the message that you have for us tonight. May glory and honor come back to you as you touch our hearts in a special way with this message. Prepare us to meet and live with you in eternity. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evangelist uh, Josephine, for uh, the opening prayer. Like we did last week, I will once again request that if any one of us will uh, have any prayer request please just feel free and uh, note it just write it uh, one of us alvin will take note of the, all the prayer requests and at the close of this presentation we shall pray like we did the other day <clears throat> happy sabbath to all of us uh happy day Today's presentation is uh, not a sermon, neither is it a sermonate, but I want to believe that it's going to be an in-depth Bible study. I want to study with you uh, one of the most fascinating stories in the Bible, and that is why I have titled the study this story. Our title today is This Story. This Story. This Story is our title for today. Our title for today is This Story. I have just greeted everyone who has come to listen to the Word of God. Uh, you know, brothers, nothing is of importance like sparing your time to just listen to the Word of God. Uh, the theme that I have selected for tonight is a very interesting theme. Please, for those of us who have uh, switched on their videos, I request that you mute your videos so that you don't destabilize uh, the, net the network. Please mute, turn off your videos, turn off your cameras. Turn off your cameras, please. Somebody here is not getting me. Somebody's camera is on. They can't tell who this person is, but let me check. Aswath, please. Aswath, please turn off your camera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was just saying that the theme that I've selected for tonight's study is a very interesting theme because if you look at the title, this story, it has an exclamation mark at the end of it. Uh, you know, we have heard of many, many stories. 
Some are interesting stories, others are scary. But I will talk about this story. I will talk about this story, not any other story, but this story. And for those who may have joined us but uh, have not developed a keen interest in the study of the Bible today, I want to plead with you just for tonight. Please try to be a keen Bible study student. I just want you to develop that, that habit. Just for this one hour, just develop the habit of a deep, in-depth Bible study. Uh, but I will also request that after the study of this story, we may consider of it. We may take advice and we may also speak our minds on this story. Please, Aswat, just turn off your camera, please. Just turn off your your video so that you may not you don't destabilize the network as what please turn off your your video camera thank you so much thank you so much today i would like us to read from the book of judges the book of judges the book of judges let us turn to the book of judges chapter number 19 a very fascinating story here that is rarely read and rarely preached and rarely talked about. Uh, let us turn to the book of Judges, chapter number 19, uh, and uh, we shall read some few verses here, and then uh, we get down to the study of the Word of God, believing that God will speak to our hearts and minds. Judges, chapter number 19, Beginning from verse 27. Judges chapter 19, beginning from verse number 27. And this is what the Bible says. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's go. But there was no answer. There was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. Verse 29. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine. Limb by limb into twelve parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came out of Egypt. <clears throat> Just imagine, we must do something, so speak up. I've read from the NIV version of the Bible. Brothers, the text, brothers and sisters, the text before us is going to be a graphic text. Let, let, me, let me put some disclaimer before we begin. The text we have just read is going to be a graphic text. But since God in his wisdom allowed it to be in the scriptures, it means God wanted it to be dealt with. So I am here tonight to deal with this text. Now, I, I, I have just read from verse 29. But friends, the text that we have just read is a text that needs to be preached, especially in our days. It needs to be considered, especially in this generation. It needs to be taken as a counsel. Therefore, we must talk about this text tonight. We have nothing to do but to talk about this text tonight. You know, God allowed this text to be in the scriptures because God knew that through the help of the Holy Spirit, we will be helped to understand this text. 
Before we get in this text, allow us to get a glimpse of what plays behind this story. And, and let me repeat this. I want you to follow me keenly because if you don't get me from the start, you won't get me at the end. So allow me just to give you a little glimpse of what plays out behind this story. You know, after the 40 years of moving in the wilderness, the children of Israel now arrived in, the, in Canaan land. And, and when they, when they, they, they found uh, themselves in the land of Canaan, when they finally settled down in the land, one of the difference that was between them and the nations that surrounded them was that the Israelites were being led by God, while the other nations around them were being led by kings. I want you to notice that difference. The difference was that when the neighbors that surrounded the Israelites were being led by kings, but the Israelites were being led by God. So this became a very big difference between them and their neighbors. Then in, in the first 50, 50 or so years, the children of Israel were indeed very obedient to God. They loved God. They listened to God. They followed the decrees of God. They were pleased by God. Then after this period, they began to be attracted to the lifestyle of the other nations. They got attracted to the lifestyle of the other nations. They got attracted to what the other nations were doing. As they got attracted to the life of the other nations and the things the other nations were doing, their own life began to change. Their experiences began to change. And this happened consistently. I'm here to say that when this began to happen, the children of Israel wanted to experience what it feels to serve the other gods. So they followed the other nations in serving their foreign gods. The end result was this. When the children of Israel left God and began serving the other gods, this is what God did. God decided that God decided that uh, whenever they chose to, to reject him and chose other gods, God would remove his hand of protection over them. And the nations that surrounded them would then attack them and slave them. And the question is, why is God removing his hand? from the nation of Israel. Why did God decide to remove his hand from the nation of Israel? And I want to say this, brothers and sisters, that God removed his hand so that the Israelites may get to know that their safety is not in their number. Their safety is not in their strength, but their safety is because of God. So God decided to remove his hand from the nation of Israel when they left God and went and began serving the other foreign gods so that the Israelites may know that they, they, they were not defeating their, their neighbors because they were strong, but they were defeating their neighbors because God was strong. God removes his hand so that the Israelites may know that they are not safe because their enemies are weak but they are safe because their God is strong. But in the absence of their God, then their enemies act in the fullness of their strength. Brothers and sisters, they would later be attacked and slaved by a neighbor for a period of 10, 15, 20, or even 30 years. And during that period of enslavement, they would then cry to God and plead with him to have mercy on them. Because God is faithful, God would have mercy on them by raising a judge that would get them out of trouble. The, the judge would lead them out. 
they get out of that trouble for another 20 to 30 years they would be happy with God and then they go again and do the same mistake the book of judges the book that is before us today covers a period of about 200 years of the same thing happening when you read the book of judges from chapter 1 to the last chapter note this the, 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 the episode in the whole book of, of Judges are, are things that happened within a period of up to almost 200 years. They would again worship God, they get spoiled, they rebel, he removes his hand, they cry, he raises a judge, they worship, they get spoiled, they rebel, he removes his hand, they cry, he raises a job, and the years roll by for 200 good years. The same thing keeps on happening in the book of Judges up until the end of this book. When the book of Judges comes to an, its end, listen to this, when the book of Judges comes to its, its end, it changes completely. It stops talking about Judges and begins talking about Levites. This is an interlude. It disturbs the story because the story is about judges, not Levites. If you wanted to talk about Levites, then that story should go to the book of Leviticus. But we find Levites coming in at the end of the book of Judges. It is important that those Levites are there because something is happening that is going to pave the way for the future of Israel. And that is what I'm here to address tonight. This that is coming up is what we are going to look at tonight. Friends, prior to the story I have read to you, the last judge we meet is Samson. Then immediately after Samson, we are not told of any other judge but Levites. Here is how the story begins. Here is how the book of Judges chapter number 19 begins. And I want you to follow me keenly. The story says there was a young Levite who left Bethlehem of Judah and made his way to Ephraim looking for a place where he can build a house. Then the story poses then it continues by saying, There was a man called Micah, whose mother was wealthy. Micah's mother lost around 1,200 pieces of silver. She lost it. Listen to me keenly. The story doesn't tell us whether the silver was stolen or how. It just says Micah's mother lost the money. Then Micah found the money, whether by finding the thief or by finding where it was lost, the story does not say. The story says Micah found the money. Then Micah comes to his mother and says, Mother, here are the 1,000 pieces of silver that you lost. Then his mother says, My son, for recovering my money, I give you 200 pieces of silver as a gift. Then the story says, Micah takes the 200 pieces of silver, he goes, melts them, and he makes an idol. Then, the Levite who was heading to Ephraim passed by Micah's house. Micah sees the Levite and says to the Levite, Man of God, where are you going? Then the Levite says, I'm on my way to Israel. I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah says, Man of God, there is no need for you to go that way. Here is a house in need of a priest. Stay here and be a priest to me and my family. I am wealthy man. I have servants. I have everything you can minister to us here. Then the young Levite accepts to stay and minister to Micah and his family. Now, brothers and sisters, 
When the story ends, it says, In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own sight. I want you to hold on to that statement. A story then starts again. The second story in Leviticus chapter 19, the second story begins. The tribe of Dan had lost their inheritance. Remember, when they arrived in Canaan land, the land was divided among them. They, for some reason, went through a battle where they lost their land that they had inherited. So they sent five spies to go and look for a new line, land. Then these five spies passed through Micah's house. And when they passed through Micah's house, they stopped at Micah's house. Then they met the Levite and said to the Levite, Man of God, what are you doing here? He gave them the answer, I was on my way to Ephraim looking for a place to build. When I came upon this house, Maker asked me to be a minister to his house. Then they said to him, Now, man of God, ask God for us if the journey we are in is good or bad. Will we find land or not? Then the Levite consults God, and God says, Tell them their journey is a blessed one. Then they went out looking for land. The story says they found the land and went back home to tell their people that they got the land. Now, they came as an army to take that land. They stopped again at Micah's house. They say the tribe of Dan, when, when they stopped at Micah's house, they, it's like, it's like they, they, they took the idol that, that the, the Levite had made in Micah's house. Then the story continues to say, they say the tribe of Dan stole the idol of silver from the house of Micah, and they say to the Levite, why should you stay here and serve such a small family? Come with us and become a minister to us. We are a nation. He went with them, that the Levite accepts and goes with them. The Levite accepts and goes with the tribe of Dan. Then the Bible says, the Levite loved the proposal. He went with them. Then the story ends. And when the story ends, notice again, when the story ends, it says, Now, in those days, there was no king in the land of Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own sight. End of the second story. Listen well. Then, story number three begins. I'm talking about the book of Judges, chapter number 19. The story number three now begins. A Levite had a wife and a concubine. And friends, don't ask me why a Levite has a concubine. I was not there. This is a story. But for now, we will accept there was a Levite who had a wife and a concubine. The concubine ran away and went back home where she came from. Then the Levite traveled to his father-in-law to bring back his concubine. When he gets to his father-in-law, his father-in-law is pleased to see him. Day one, day, day two, day three, day four, they eat, they drink, they talk, they enjoy. Day four, the Levite gets up to leave and the father-in-law tells him, my son, relax. I hardly get to see you. Stay with me for another day. Then the Levite again stays. Day five, the Levite says it is time for them to leave. The man tries to stop him again, but this time the Levite decides to leave against his father-in-law's wish. Perhaps, this is my opinion, perhaps, he had to leave because it was a Friday and he was chasing Sabbath preparation. Then on his way back home, it gets dark. His servant says to him, Master, we are passing through the city of the Jebusites. That is Jerusalem. The Levite says, No, 
I will not branch into the city of pagans. We will travel until we meet the city where the Israelites stay. Where there, we will settle down. So they traveled and they found the city belonging to Israelites. Then unfortunately, no one welcomed them. They settled in the market. Then towards midnight, an old man coming from the fields, passing through the marketplaces, sees them. Then he says, man of God, why are you and your servant and wife seated here? The Levite says, we desire no bread, we desire no water, we have what we need, all we want is just a place to stay and no one is letting us in. The old man agrees and takes them. Then in the old man's house, they hear a knock at the door. When the old man opens the door, it is the man of the city. The man of the city has come to demand that the old man bring out the Levite who came to his house that they may know him by sleeping with him. Let him who has an ear hear what that means. Let him who has an ear hear what that means. The old man says, this is abominable. How dare can they sleep with a Levite? He says, I have servants who are females, who are even virgins. If this is about sleeping, I will give you my own servants that you may sleep with them, but not on a man of God, who is also a Levite. Then they insist to be given the Levite. The old man says, look, the Levite even has a concubine, maybe the concubine. So they agree and take the concubine and slept with her the whole night till morning. Then in the morning, they came and dropped her in front of the door. She crawls up to the door with her last breath. Just before she could knock the door, she dies with her hand holding on to the door. When the Levite opens the door the next morning, he sees the carcass of his concubine. He can tell that she is dead. He puts her on to a donkey and takes her home. When he gets home, he takes an axe or a saw or a knife, whatever it was, he cuts her into 12 pieces and he sends each piece to every tribe of Israel and he says to them, this is what was done to me in the house of Israel. Listen to this. Look at it, take counsel, and speak on it. Then the story ends again by saying, In those days, there was no king in the land of Israel. And everyone did what was right in their sight. Friends, this is a tragic story. This is a painful story. But what is more painful in the story is that it is an old story playing about itself today before our own eyes. There is something that people call postmodernism. In philosophy, people call it postmodernism. Some people say it began in the late 80s. Others say it is 1990 towards 2000. I don't care when it began. But there is something today known as postmodernism. Postmodernism simply says, do what you do if it works for you. That is good. But don't bother me about doing what I do. It works for me. It simply says, don't tell me what to do. Do what works for you, I will do what works for me, post-modernism. I'm talking about post-modernism. In the book of Judges chapter 19, 
I see the principle of postmodernism. In postmodernism, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no truth, there is no error. We each have our own truth. It is the culture of Sipangwingui in Kenyan 2022 language. Postmodernism. Under postmodernism, it is not the fact that there is a God. In postmodernism, if having a God works for you, then well. If it doesn't work for me, then it's well with me. That is postmodernism. Friends, the story that we have just read addresses exactly that. Israel is in a time in which I call situational ethics. This is to say, what I am doing now is going to count. But if it doesn't count today, it may count tomorrow. What I'm doing now is going to work. But if it doesn't work today, it may work tomorrow. And do not call to me on it. That is what we call situational ethics. It is what is killing the church today. Let me give you an example of situational ethics in the SD church. You know, the Seventh-day Adventist church is very big on health. We don't like unhealthy things. We believe that God did not just save the spirit. He saved the body too. The body must eat well, sleep well, exercise, drink water and breathe fresh air. That is what we teach and believe. Bear in mind that we don't believe that you are saved by being healthy. We believe when you are saved, being healthy is part of the fruits. For example, in our church, we do not judge people for eating meat. Listen to me keenly. In this church, we do not judge people for eating meat. But we discourage meat eating. Now, some of us have succeeded. They no longer eat meat. Others are halfway. They only eat white meat like me. Others are still eating all with the exception of pork. Now, as a church employee, I must emulate all the teachings of the church. I must put them in practice. Now, you will find, for example, that I may not have succeeded yet in the meat battle. But I apply situational ethics. In front of congregants, I don't eat meat so that I don't offend anyone. But in my house, I eat meat. That is what I call situational ethics, which many pastors practice today. Situational ethics. It may apply here, but not everywhere. Situational ethics teaches that something may apply here, but not there. This type of ethics doesn't have a constant, non-changing principle. It gauges the situation and asks, will this work here? If not, then you don't do it there. If it doesn't work today, wait for tomorrow. It might work tomorrow. That is what we call situational ethics. Back to the text. Israel has become a country of situational ethics. That is why the Bible keeps on repeating the line, and everyone did what was right in his own sight. Mark my words clearly. The church has become a church of situational ethics. What is killing the church, what is ailing the church, is just one simple thing. We need to get it right and address it. It is situational ethics. This is because whatever God taught them, 
They were no longer interested. God has given them timeless principles. But for them, they prefer a postmodernic setup where you do what you do and please don't ask me when I don't do what you do. Where you do what you love and please don't question me when I don't do what you love. This principle is killing my church today and I weep for my church. In Israel, we meet Levites that lived with idols. In the church today, we meet pastors who live with idols. We meet ministers who even practice the underworld faith. Situational ethics, postmodernic era. Levites that have concubines. It has become a place where each man is right in his own sight. If you don't want a concubine, that is your own issue. I want one. If you don't love idols, that is okay. I love them. If you don't want dancing in the church, that is okay. With you, I like it. If you don't want rock music in the church, it is fine. I will use it because it works for me. Situational ethics. Friends, I know what I'm teaching tonight may land me to problems. But let me repeat, what is ailing the church is very simple. Situational ethics. If you don't love idols, it is okay with you. I love them. If you don't want dancing in the church, it is okay. I like it. If you don't want rock music in the church, it is fine. I will use it because it works for me. Situational ethics is killing the church. Situational ethics does not only happen in the society. Right in the church of God, before our own eyes, we see church leaders have become leaders of situational ethics. Today, there is no wrong. There is no wrong. You have your wrong, I have my right. It is all circumstantial, depending on the angle you are coming from. And the church is dying before our own eyes. If there was a church today, we would be in a position where we say, for example, a poor guy gets a girl pregnant in the church. What do we do? We disfellowship him. A rich guy gets a girl pregnant in the church and we say, let us look at the merits. How did this happen? Situational ethics. It applies here, it doesn't apply there. In Israel, we had Levites who likes fame more than ministry. He is going somewhere, but because Mecca has money, he stops. He doesn't call Mecca to order and say, if you want me to minister to your family, then you must get these idols out of here. When he saw the silver and gold, he says, this guy is rich. Never will I turn down this offer. Today in the church, we have ministers who are running after money. Everything is money-oriented, money-geared. Every project, we ask ourselves, what are we going to get after doing this? And in Israel, we have a Levite. When a new tribe with a bigger pocket offers him proposal, he looks and says, being a pastor to 50 people, I will move to 10,000 people. Today, our church is full of pastors who work by numbers. They work with what they get. They ask themselves, what will I get? We have elders. We have choirs who go out and and make albums not to preach the word, but to earn more. And the church is dying before our own eyes. Pastors today don't want to preach the truth. Preachers no longer preach the truth. One gospel applies in the village. 
And when you take that gospel to the town, it doesn't apply. One gospel is meant for town people, but doesn't apply to the villagers. Situational ethics is killing the church. Here is the issue. And nobody will dare tell you this, brothers and sisters. I know it may cost me my job, my life, my reputation, and my everything, but I must say this tonight. God is not in this. Money is in this. Today, we strive so much to make people emotionally high. Then, by doing that, they believe in us. It is no longer the cross, it is the cash. It is no longer the calling, it is the cashing. We don't preach the gospel today in and out of session. We preach it where the economy is good. You, 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 you make a service request and send it to a choir. They, they receive three service calls from different places. They have the letters, they sit down, they begin looking at the letters, they ask themselves, from all these letters where which letter comes from a place where the economy is good that which comes from where the economy is good is that which they will honor situational ethics our preachers our choirs our evangelists today don't follow where he may lead them the song says where he may lead me i will go we no longer follow where he may lead us we follow where the economy is doing well. Today it is preach the gospel the way it works for you. I will preach it the way it works for me. And the end result, we see before our own eyes dramatists and jokers on our pulpits. People are using our pulpits for fame. People are using our pulpit for their own intentions. They are building their own kingdoms while standing on our pulpits. It is no longer the gospel. The end result, we see before our own eyes dramatists in the pulpits. We see jokers on the pulpits. We hear repeatedly questionable remarks and applications that only triggers laughter and emotions to the glory of the preacher but not to the glory of God on our pulpits. Everyone is doing what is right in their own sight and nobody dares to correct the mess. Then we get to this Levite who had a concubine. I don't want to judge him too much because the social conditions of his days are not too clear for me. But I do know that having a concubine is contrary to holiness of God and the Levite's work. Firstly, let me tell you something from this story. These guys are cowards. Listen to the story carefully. When they were facing danger, when they should be protecting women, they offered the women to the men for sex. That showed the failure of morality in those days. And we still witness the failure of morality in the church of God before our own eyes. Our society today has become an abusive society. Our young men were not taught what it means to be a man. Man was not given strength to beat a woman, but to protect a woman. Let me repeat that to the men who are gathered here. Man was not given strength to beat a woman. Man was given strength to protect the woman. In this postmodern society, a woman has become to men just something to rape. It is shameful, brothers and sisters. God is looking for men who can dominate through the mind not through their pennies. A real man doesn't rape. He makes a proposal. He defends the proposal. And when the proposal is granted, he is let in. A godly man is not a politician. You make a promise and you fulfill. You work hard and fulfill that promise. And may the men who are gathered here listen to that. 
A man, a real man of God stays. A real man of God starts and finishes something. True man stays for decades. Come rain or sunshine, they stay. Even if she can't boil rice, you stay. When she throws the boiling rice at you, you stay. Teach your men this. Our society is rotten. A man fulfills his oath to God even if the wife disrespects him. He fulfills his oath to God, not to the woman. We made an oath to God, not to the women. Our problem today, we have postmodernic cowards in the name of men. Instead of facing the battle, they offer up their women. Real men don't throw up their daughters out because they have become pregnant. They don't. By throwing her out, where will she get wisdom? Because by becoming pregnant, the girl has announced to you that she is foolish. When you throw her out, where will she get wisdom? The Bible says that when the, when, 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 when the concubine came back dead, the Levite touched her. You know, it was not recommended for a Levite to touch a dead body, but he touched her. And why did he touch her? Because he wanted to prove his righteousness. He cuts her into 12 pieces and then sends her away. Friends, I want to finish. But listen to this. Listen to this keenly, brothers and sisters. This concubine represents a number of things. But more than the rest, this concubine represents you and me. So many of us who are listening to me are like this concubine, cut into 12 pieces because of postmodernism. Every one of us who is gathered here, our lives are divided into pieces. Our lives are divided into pieces, pieces, and we don't know where those pieces are. Our lives are divided into different pieces, and we can't tell where those pieces are. Most of us are seated here, and they are like the dead concubine. Each of our pieces belong to somebody else. We have been scattered all over the world. We have different masters running different parts of our lives. Our lives have been torn into pieces. We can't even recollect it. There is a piece of you that belongs to a boyfriend. Another piece of you belongs to your studies. There is a piece of you that belongs to the underworld. And another piece that belongs to your family. There is a piece of you that belongs to your friends. There is a piece of you again that is struggling to put, struggling to put your family together. I'm repeating that we are gathered here. But we are like the concubine. Our, our part of life is divided and we can't recollect it. There is a piece of you... That is dying because you are suffering a terminal illness. Your life has been torn into pieces. You have, you have a head that belongs to another. An arm that belongs to another. A, an ear that belongs to another. An eye that belongs to another. Our life has been torn apart in order to please the many masters that we have. Come to the church of God. The church has been torn apart. We have part of the church that embraces postmodernic thinking. We have another part of the church that advocates for the true worship of God. We have another part of the church that doesn't care about the good or the bad. We have another part of the church that is so liberal, another part of the church so much conservative, we are divided and torn apart and confused. In fact, my church is confused. It is horrible. We even don't sleep at night. Once you get home, 
You must get straight to your WhatsApp and begin pleasing one of your masters who own a piece of your life. You please that master until midnight. And in the midnight when you think you are done with that master, when you are about to sleep, another master wakes up you. And he, be he begins to demand for your attention. You begin pleasing that man's master again from midnight until morning. When morning reaches, you want to wake up and begin your daily routine. Another master comes. Our life is divided, torn. We please so many masters. Our young people's lives have been torn apart. On one side, drugs is your master. On another side, alcohol is your master. On one side, masturbation is your master. On the other side, devil worshipping is your master. They have so many masters. I have come to say one thing tonight. There is a Jesus who can bring all the pieces of your life together to his glory under one house. I come to offer you one bank that can offer custody to all your accounts. He is Jesus. May you accept him tonight. Friends, you know, having many masters is exhausting. To answer to many lords is tiring. You need one master to run your life. You only need one master to run your life. To gather all your pieces of life together. The Levite who are supposed to protect you have failed you. The Levites who are supposed to protect God's church have failed God's church. The men who are supposed to protect the faith have failed on the test. But there is a Levite who never fails. is Jesus. All the Levites have, have run into the postmodernic era. Where there is no right, there is no wrong. You have your right, I have my right. You have your wrong, I have my wrong. If what you do works for you, it is good. If it works for me, it is good. Don't count me on anything. The Levites who are supposed to bring sanity have failed the test. Sometimes, you know, young people come to church to get help. And they even get worse. You come to church to ask an elder to pray for you. Then he sees a girlfriend in you. You ask your pastor to pray for you. He sees a concubine in you. Friends, I'm here to say, Levites down here may fail you, but not Jesus. Take it. Levites down here may fail you, but not Jesus. The book of Judges, chapter number 19, has repeated this statement three times. In those days, there was no king in the land of Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own sight. Look at the church today. It is like the church is behaving like there is no king in the church today. It is like the, the church no longer has a king. Every person wakes up from their house, they go to the church and begin doing what is right in their own eyesight. Our preachers are preaching what is right in their own sight. Our choirs are singing what is right on their sight. Everybody is busy doing what is right in their own sight. Our evangelists today, we no longer follow where the Lord may lead us. We follow where we want to go. This story, friends, this story must be preached in my church. This story must be considered. This story must be talked about. Whether men and women of the cloth want to listen, this story is a timely story. This story is a timely story. Our society today is rotten. The church is rotten. But this story must be told. Let me finish by saying the following. Let me finish by saying the following. 
the end result of whatever we witness today, we see before our own eyes things happening in the name of worship that contradicts the truth as it's laid down by God in the Bible. I submit to you, this church has a king. Let's not behave as if the king is dead. The king laid out a plain truth on how things and this business should be conducted. Let's not behave as if the church has no king. This story may be of help to you. This story may help you to conduct yourself tomorrow. Because I know most of us here will be worshipping somewhere. May this story help you to know that this church has a God. May this story speak to your soul. May you avoid this postmodernic thinking where people think what is right for me is not right for you. Where people think having a God, if it works for you, it is well. If it doesn't work for them, it is well with them. Friends, in the land of God, in the land of God, his pattern is the formula. In the land of God, his decree is the formula. In the land of God, his way is the formula. In the land of God, his command is the formula. May God help us, even as you consider this story. Because I only had one request before I wind up. You know why I brought this story? So that we may consider it. So that we may take advice. So that we may speak our minds. Now, after this, take your time, consider this story. Take your time, take advice from this story. Take your time, speak your mind to your friends and with your friends concerning this story. If God wanted to bring revival and reformation in the land of Israel, he used one person and that was Elijah. May God use you to bring a reformation in the church of God. May God use you just one person to bring a reformation in the church of God. May God bless us tonight. May God sustain us. May God keep us as we think about this story. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank God for you who logged into the program. We, we thank God for you. I want to pray that next week we again get back to this uh, platform so that we may continue with the word of God. Before we finish, let me ask uh, Alvin if there may be any person who has sent in any prayer request. Al Alvin, can you hear me? Alvin, please, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And yes, I can hear you, Pastor. Do we have any prayer requests today? Yes, we have two prayer requests. Please share. Some are still pending. The first two prayer requests you have received. We have a prayer request from J.H. Onanda. It's just a prayer request for our daughter is not feeling well. Our daughter is sick. She's praying for a prayer. Then we have, we have also our brother, Shem, Shem Moseti. We have a prayer request.